Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Hall. I'm executive director here at Montclair Film. Welcome to the Montclair Film Festival and our Q&A for Unapologetic. I'm so grateful uh, to welcome uh, Ashley O'Shea, the director of the film. Hello, Ashley. Hey, how's it going? Great, thank you. And we have uh, Morgan Johnson as well. Morgan Elise Johnson, excuse me, Morgan. Uh, Morgan Elise Johnson, producer of the film. Hi, Morgan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So I want to start off, uh, Ashley, asking you about sort of the genesis of this production. Um, we were very fortunate to talk to our friends at Cartemquin Films in Chicago, who are a well-known staple of the nonfiction filmmaking community there in Chicago, uh, who turned us on to this movie and were just knocked out by it. And I'm, I'm wondering about the genesis in the beginning of you deciding to immerse yourself in the community and make this movie, uh, what was the motivating factor to begin the process? Yeah, so when I started the project, it was the fall of 2015, um, and I was actually interning at Cartoon Point at the time, um, but it was right around the time that there was a lot of uh, buzz and conversation on, on social media and the public space about the killing of a young black woman named Rakia Boyd. Um, and the lack of the lack of accountability that had been brought against her killer, um, police officer Dr. Servin, um, that prior spring. And so at the time, uh, young black people in Chicago had just started or they were continuing to organize um, to, to try to find some accountability um, uh, in regard to this police officer. I um, mean, a, in a way that they did this was uh, by attending these these monthly uh, police board hearings um, where citizens uh, are able to have this sort of this forum and direct contact um, with a with an appointed uh, board that's supposed to you know handle all cases of police misconduct uh, hiring firings accountability things of that nature um, and so just you know by ha having been ex exposed and, and seeing a lot on the internet and, and being in Chicago at the time I attended one of the one of the board hearings and and uh, you know the forum was was eventually shut down by young black community organizers and, and leaders in the space, um, and it really struck me that the the people that were leading in the space and that were that were speaking and and uh, the most visible were young black women, young black trans folks, uh, feminine folks, just. People that that I identified with closely and that I had, you know, not really been introduced in my formal education when we talked about community organizing and, and activism, um, and I was just completely the the energy was just amazing, and so um, that's when I approached May, one of the protagonists of the film, about about making a piece about um, from the perspective of young black women uh, in the movement, and then it kind of just. It kept it kept growing from there. Uh, and how did you and Morgan come to work together on the project? What was your relationship like as a producer and a director? This movie is very, um, I don't know what the right word is. I want to say verite, um, but, you know, it, it's boots on the ground, uh, immersing yourself in a story and being a participant in that story. So I'm wondering what the production process was like for the two of you working together on the film. Yeah, I'll let... Well, I'll start, I guess, and Morgan can Morgan can add a little bit too. But um, yeah, pretty much for the first year of production, um, just because there was so much I didn't know about the process, and I I really at the time when I started thought it was going to be a shorter piece. I didn't have visions of a feature length film. Um, but as as events kept occurring that fall and into the next year, and I just kind of kept filming. Um, I knew that that there was more that I wanted to cover and more people I wanted to involve. Um, and I think the fall of that next year, um, we did a, a crowdfunding campaign um, because prior to that, I was kind of just borrowing and stealing favors um, <laughs> to, to try to, you know, DP and, and produce and do everything else I needed to do to make sure that we got the right coverage. Um, but we crowdfunded that fall. And um, after after that campaign, I really started to look to build out um, a, a production team. And um, I think Morgan just kind of kept hearing about the project from many different sides. 
Um, <laughs> and I kind of, I knew, I knew who Morgan was just because she was already kind of in the Cartemplin family. And uh, we also both went to Northwestern. So um, after we did that, that campaign and had a little bit of seed funding, uh, I think that's when I first approached you, Morgan. Mm. You have more to add. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so crazy being like young and black during this time because I remember life before Trayvon and then like after Trayvon. So I remember, you know, I had graduated from Northwestern, um, studied film there, and then went to work in Milwaukee at a production company. And then Trayvon happened and other cases like Trayvon happened in Milwaukee. And I'm, you know, I'm working on a film about Judaism. I haven't really gotten a chance to tell a story about Black lives, but um, it, it really started to affect me and watching and analyzing what was happening happening in the in the news. I actually ended up leaving my full time producing job in Milwaukee with 371 Productions and Brad Lichtenstein and just saying, I need to be doing something and telling stories about Black people. And I need to go to Chicago to do that. Um, because Chicago at that time was the dominant narrative of, you know, the so-called Black on Black violence and crime. So I wanted to make a difference with that. So I started my company, The Tribe. And then at the very same time, as I'm coming back to Chicago, <laughs> Cartimpwin was like, oh, you're back. You can make films now. And I'm like, no, no, no. I just started a company. I'm going to do a publication. And they kept nudging and nudging and nudging because I was a former intern at Northwestern. They knew I was producing already. And they said, you really need to see the footage that Ashley is working with. And Ashley sent me a demo. I had no intentions of joining this film, but I ended up writing her several paragraphs of notes. And <laughs> at that point, I was just, I was all in. So um, that's how I got involved with the project. And, you know, being um, uh, Black artists working at this time and, um, you know, of a certain generation, a younger generation than myself, I'm wondering how you felt the process of making this film has impacted your citizenship, your understanding of your community, the way in which you interact with people uh, in Chicago uh, and in the national story uh, of Black Lives Matter as well. Um, has, that, has this project transform, been transformative? Has it reinforced things you already knew? Uh, how has it changed you guys? No, it has certainly, it certainly has transformed me and um, just grown me up a lot as a, as a person. Um, I was really young when I started the film. I was 22 years old. And, uh, you know, prior to, prior to starting production, I, I had had kind of a similar level of engagement, engagement around like the killings of Trayvon Martin and, and Mike Brown. Um, but I was in school at the time. And so I really w didn't have the opportunity to go as, deep as I wanted. Um, and so I think through making Unapologetic, uh, one, I just learned how institutionalized um, a lot of these issues are. You know, when it comes to policing in Chicago, the police get $40 million a day to operate. And even, even larger portions of that are put out every year in, uh, in to, for police misconduct settlements. Um, and those are taxpayer dollars. And, you know, that's, there's just, there's, there's so many, um, the web is so much deeper um, than, than you see on the service level. But, you know, the, what we see in the streets and in the public are, are, are symptoms of these institutionalized issues. And so I think un uh, uh, making Unapologetic and in, in working with Janae and Bella and just observing their work, it really um, showed me how deeply entrenched these issues are. Um, but also it just showed it really... Um, it shows how resilient Chicago is, how resilient Black women and, and Black voices are in Chicago in particular. Um, and being able to be have an intimate um, look with Janae and Bella at their own personal lives and how they just grow and change throughout the process, um, it just gave me a lot of hope about, about how we can have to deal with these really difficult and tough and multi-year issues, um, but that we can still maintain a semblance of ourselves and, and who we want to be. Did you also want to answer that? Um, I can try. I mean, I've been interrogating so many aspects of my existence 
throughout this process and like what justice means to me, what equity means to me, and even uh, what filmmaking means to me and like my role in the power structure as a filmmaker, uh, the politics of that. Is it like who should tell our stories? Um, when should we do personal narrative documentaries? Um, being a director and a producer and inserting ourselves into communities that have systematically and institutionally experienced so much harm, you know, as a Northwestern graduate who is from like the peripheral parts of, you know, the Chicagoland area. And then, you know, I meet a character like Bella who she, she resisted to filming with us for the majority of the process. We got most of the scenes from Bella while we were already in post because it took so long to build that trust. So I was constantly interrogating myself and our process and thinking like, are we doing the right thing? Are, like, how can we tell stories that really make an impact? And um, really just thinking about the framing of narratives and how important they are in shaping people's minds and like what a awesome, but also heavy responsibility that we have. So um, I don't know if that answered questions. It was kind of like I asked a lot of questions, but those <laughs> were the things that were, that I was processing while making this film because, you know, it's, it was, it ended up being, I think Ashley can contest to this as well, like much bigger mm -hmm. in terms of like impact than we immediately thought, you know, in the beginning stages. I was going to say, you know, from an outsider's perspective on this community, one of the things that struck me is we see so many documentary, you're talking about the ethics of documentary film. We see so many documentary films where people sort of parachute in to tell someone else's story uh, and then jump out and go edit it and, you know, take it on the road. This feels very much immersed in the community. I think I was trying to get that point across in my first question. There, the, uh, authenticity is a tough word because, you know, it's you're making editorial choices, you're building story and structure. Um, it's not a lived experience, but it's a document of, of your subjects and you're building trust with them. But it feels very much like a throwback uh, to an earlier time in documentary film that is not concerned about, it's a concern with the truth of the experience of your subject. I don't feel like you're trying to make a point or tell a story. You're letting your subjects make their point and tell their story. And you are elevating those stories through the film. Can you talk a little bit about that? Your approach, am I interpreting that wrong? How did you feel about your relationship to your subjects? You mentioned the responsibility of telling their stories, but how did you relate to that um, in putting the story together and continuing to shoot? How did you know when you were done? Because obviously um, Chicago is still uh, facing, you know, all of these challenges. Our country is still facing all of these challenges. Um, there's so much to talk about. Yeah, I would I would say that's a, a solid interpretation of uh, where we eventually ended up <laughs> in the process. Um, there were a lot of roadblocks and and dialogues that happened along the way, um, especially because for a very long time we were more so deferring to the movement at large and to this sort of landscape of organizations and collectives in Chicago and, and all of the work that they were doing, not just specifically around the two police killings in the film. Um, but we found that as we started to workshop the film and, and get feedback on it that, um, you know, one, that's just like too many stories to tell um, and that you can't, you can't tell everybody's story, I guess, and especially in, in a movement space where people have so many different approaches even within the same organization, you know, it was hard to try to give like a manifesto about like BYP 100 or Let Us Breathe and all these groups that we kind of feature. Um, but people continue to gravitate towards the stories and journeys of Janae and Bella. Um, and that's when we really, so, you know, after getting that feedback and, and trying a bunch of different things, that's when we really just started to lean into um, Janae and Bella's narratives and I think that's ultimately why it took, you know, uh, four, four and a half years, because as Morgan said, it took us a while to to build that trust with with both of them. And then also just, you know, to allow life to happen um, uh, at some point. And, you know, maybe because I was in it, I didn't realize it, but I was like, oh, like, 
your early 20s are like really pivotal in the, in the direction of your life. Um, and I wanted, so I, I think accidentally, but gratefully, like we were able to show, to show that journey. Um, I had another point about, oh, and in terms of, yeah, uh, in terms of when we decided to, to stop filming, I think that was our, like with both of them, we kind of had, you know, Janae, her, her presenting her PhD proposal. I knew that was going to be a big endpoint for her. And then for Bella, um, we really just like, as we started to edit, we start, we started to see this narrative about uh, prison abolition and like her relationship to incarceration to start to unfold. Um, so once we journeyed with her to see her brother in prison, I think that was like a moment when we knew that we were we were probably done uh, because that was that's something so you know central and integral to her life. And once I felt like we had hit those moments with both of them, um, I think that's that's when we decided to you know wrap things up. The, the one of the things I I've been you know as I follow along with uh, politics and Black Lives Matter in the country now is this notion that Black women have always been doing the work um, and that it's exhausting and tiring um, and that the country needs to follow and come along with Black women and let them lead but and offer them support when they need it and all the, you know all of the uh, aspects of of citizenship and support that should be extended, uh, fully realized. And I think this film did a really great job of illuminating on that point. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the role of women in particular in this movie and in your conception of it? I know there are activists on, uh, on the LGBTQ plus community who are involved in the film and uh, there are all sorts of different activists, but you centered on two women and their stories. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those, that choice with your subject. I wanted to see if Morgan was gonna go first. But that was <laughs> um, yeah, I think you should go first, and then I'll chime in about. Okay. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was always I don't. That's always an interesting question because it was never really a thought. Like it wasn't a. I guess it was a decision I made, but like I maybe because I'm a black woman and I grew up in a family of black women. Um, you know, like you said, they've been, they were bedrocks to my family and, and, and what happened in our communities. Um, and so I just really, you know, the, the energy and the warmth and the sort of forward motion that you see in Unapologetic is what so many of us feel in our own communities with, with the Black women in our lives. Um, and so I just felt like that hadn't been given, I still don't think it's been given its due justice in, in the media and storytelling landscape because there's so many nuances and layers, even even um, within certain communities, that it, it deems several movies about Black women-led movements um, and and resistance. Um, but what I really also enjoyed about it was it it gave me an impetus as well to learn a lot about the history of Black women's activism in this country. I think this was probably the first time um, you know I read up about Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells. And people that have really like set the the groundwork, the the bedrock of of our organiz our our organized movements, um, but just have not been given the same elevation as like an MLK or a Malcolm X, um, Meg or Everest folks like that. And so I think uh, it was also just like kind of a, a selfish reason too, because I wanted to learn more and have the space to, um, you know, there's a, a little bit of archival in the beginning and. Um, and throughout the film and I, I just wanted to understand that uh, those approaches more that come from these historical movements um and try to embody that you know and, and merge that did i pause am i okay okay you're good <laughs> sorry um i wanted, okay i wanted to try to embody that um energy and merge that with what janae and bella are doing um in their communities mm. so i'll just say that uh when we get this question, it's always so funny because it was like the thesis of our film that we wrote into every grant proposal and got denied for, for like the first three years of making this film, right? That like, why do we only know about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Fred Hampton and we don't know about Ella Baker and, you know, all of those all of those women who also were working and not just in the kitchen and like bringing these men sandwiches, you know? Um, but 
<laughs> Don't laugh at me, Ashley. Sorry. <laughs> specific example. I'm sorry. That's what we saw. I mean, in the movie Selma, that's what we saw. We saw women in the kitchen. And it's just like, okay, women were leading this movement. Women were on the ground. Women were putting uh, their bodies on the line in civil rights. And we just do not learn those narratives. And institutions don't want to fund those narratives. And we know this because it took so much to get this film funded. So when we get this question of like, oh, we're so glad that you covered mm -hmm. women. Why did you think to do that? It's like, yeah, we covered women despite institutional support and you know, just backing of people and community and audience members who would watch the film and tell us, where are the men? Where are the black men? And we're just like, if this film is the one opportunity for you to sit down for 86 minutes and listen to young black women, then great because you probably <laughs> wouldn't do it otherwise and we see it in the men in the movement scene where a woman is leading a protest chant and men are just walking by and snatching the mic out of her hands and that's kind of like what happens sometimes in the black community when men uh, are just looking at themselves and how they can get into position of power and oftentimes they do it by stepping over uh, women and gender non-conforming folks so yeah, uh, I'm like, how do I wrap that up? <laughs> how do I wrap that up? Yeah, so it, it is very intentional. Even when we think of the movement for black lives, that it's founded by three black women, they often are not seen as the figureheads of the movement. Um, we see other people who I will not name as being referenced <laughs> constantly as the voices of the movement for black lives and they are men, um, but, Black women really are holding communities together. And this particular movement is placing Black women at the center. And that needed to be uh, the, the root of this story. That's a fantastic answer. So I don't know if you had any self-doubt there, but that was perfect. <laughs> um, that was wonderful. So uh, a final question for you guys. Um, you know, we're in a very contentious moment in history, but when haven't we been? I always try to remind myself um, how do you see this film um, getting out into the world? You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You're showing it at the film festival. We're so grateful for that. What's the life for the movie been? Where are you going next with it? And what's next on the horizon for both of you? So, yeah, we're, um, you know, we had the, the privilege of world premiering at the Black Star Film Festival earlier this year, which I think was a perfect, you know, platform for this moment that we're in. And despite it having to be virtual, um, you know, having the, and with all the festivals that are virtual, just having the ability to reach a broader audience, I think, um, than, than maybe, you know, in person at the theater. Um, so we're, we're continuing, you know, um, with that throughout the fall, um, but we're also working on a pretty robust impact campaign, um, both in Chicago and nationally to I think ultimately try to get this hand try to get this film in the hands of organizers um, to use as a resource and a tool um, as they are continuing to to fight and organize um, in this current in this current moment um, and I also hope that it can be a, a a connection tool between what we were seeing what we're seeing now and and how that was you know already happening in 2015 when we were filming and like you said like Historically, there's been so many other moments where um, where, where similar similar um, issues have come up, and that we've had to feel like we're starting a whole new approach. But so many times, it's already that foundation has been laid. We just have to sit with ourselves and be patient and find the frameworks uh, so that we can do it, do it, uh, give it the justice it deserves. So um, we're we're working to um, implement that over the next year or so, and hoping to. Um, you know, we did an outdoor screening, um, an outdoor like socially distance event right after the premiere. And, and we're hoping to mimic that model um, when it gets warm. Well, I guess other places are still warm, but in the spring <laughs> and summer for Chicago, um, we're hoping to mimic that model. And like I said, especially with organizers, just like hand them a, a package and be like, this is like, this is how you can put on a screening on the side of a building in your community. Um, because, I, you know, I really, uh, to Morgan's point, there's there can be such a detachment between kind of like the academic types and, and even like both of us are, I would say, middle class professionals. And so like 
we we don't want to lose that community aspect and we want we want the film to be available to people that are closest to the issues because that's where the solutions are going to come from and so we're working with our our impact team to to build that so that we're able to do that over the next year or so mm. Yeah, this moment is so interesting because, you know, the documentary community, at least here in Chicago, is pretty tight. And so we have these discussions and we talk about like how can we can really make an impact here in Chicago. And now we're faced with the pandemic and the uprisings and we are forced to figure it out. We are forced to get the content to the people. And a lot of times film festivals create barriers, right? Like the film would have premiered in Philadelphia at the Black Star Film Festival and nobody from Chicago would have been able to see it. But instead we have this instance where it's virtual, it was available to everyone and we kind of got to watch it with community, with our families, with Chicago. Um, so in a lot of ways, this really kind of opened things up for us to be able to do impact in a more creative and inclusive way. That's really wonderful. And that's great to hear. And, you know, we hope that uh, if there's any uh, way to reach folks through what we're doing in Montclair, we'd love to be a part of that conversation with you as well. Um, are there uh, other projects that you're working on for the future? I know this is just now rolling out. We just premiered and that's often an obnoxious question for filmmakers to <laughs> hear when it's like, we just finished, dude. Um, but is there, uh, uh, what's next? I just feel like your voices are so important uh, and the film you made is so deeply felt and personal and, and intimate with the community. I'd love to know that there's, you know, something on the horizon for another project. You know, I'm I'm letting the cards fall where they may. I am, uh, like you said, I'm I'm still coming off of the whirlwind of our premiere, and you know, there's still so much going on with the film. Um, but as I, I shared briefly earlier in the call, that I've started to um, produce more. I'm starting to get more back into the freelance work I was doing. Um, I'm a freelance cinematographer, and Apparently I'm trying to be a producer. I mean, I, I produced this film too, but like, I don't know. It's like, I'm I'm like kind of claiming it now. So um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of just like doing shorter form content right now, trying to like just get my feet wet again. Um, and I'm hoping eventually I have a, a personal doc about my family's patriarch um, from, from Mobile, Alabama that I'm hoping to, um, you know, start thinking about and developing. Uh, sometime in the future, but yeah. Awesome, Morgan? Well, you know, so when I'm not making documentaries, I'm running <laughs> the tribe.com with two eyes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's just so much to cover, I mean, with news. So one thing that we're working on are just expanding what news means and um, what impact means for for um, publications. I mean, publications don't usually, I'm not sure if they really think about impact strategy, but since I come from the documentary world, I tried to infuse that into what we do. So we're thinking about like, how can we be of, of help during this remote learning period? Um, so we have a project that's going to incorporate some inclusive histories about Chicago with um, black people, brown people, indigenous people, um, just things that are usually missing from curriculums and seeing how we can provide um, space on the tribe.com for, uh, for those types of topics to, to aid teachers and parents and youth um, throughout this challenging time. That's really terrific, both of you. Before we go, I just wanted to say, um, we are also showing uh, City So Real, Steve James's new film at the festival. I see these films as very different, but, uh, you know, brothers and sisters in Chicago. Um, and I would just encourage folks, if you were interested in Unapologetic and have watched the Q&A to this point, I'm assuming you are, um, that you check out that film as well, uh, playing on our virtual platform, because uh, I think you draw a lot from it based on what we saw in this film. They're very different movies and uh, but uh, both wonderful looks at what's happening in Chicago. Um, Ashley, I want to thank you so much for bringing this film to us. 
Um, we really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate both of you being here for the Q&A. Thank you so much for your time.